Hi, everybody. This talk is about anomaly detection at scale. Before we start, I want to talk about a little problem with data. This is Waldo. If I ask you where Waldo is now, it's obviously very easy to find him. But if I ask you where Waldo is now, it's much more difficult. You have to put more work into it and search through a crowd of people. So one of the problems with data is scale. At small scale, lots of things are really easy to do. At larger scale, they become a tougher problem to crack. If you look at our data, we have a lot of data and within it, we have lots of hidden anomalies hiding inside the data. And our users expect us to help them find those anomalies in the data. Currently in our anomaly detection system, which we'll talk about, we have over 1.1 million time series that we uh, constantly run and detect anomalies within them. So in this talk, we're gonna talk about detecting anomalies. We're gonna talk about architecting for cost and for scale. We'll talk about predicting the future, some models, and give you a sum in summary, a recipe you may want to use in your use cases. Before we start, I want to introduce ourselves. My name is Ofer Dubrovsky. I'm a big data dev lead at Nielsen. And I think serverless is the revolution. And with me is Max Perez, a big data engineer. And in his view, the devil is in the details. We are part of Nielsen Marketing Cloud, which is a data management platform, DMP for short. And we build marketing segments and device graphs. Our data is used for running campaigns and for making business decisions. In a nutshell, we're cloud native. We run predominantly on AWS. Uh, we use a lot of Spark. We run many Spark jobs every day and lots of Lambda functions and other serverless technologies. In total, we store about five petabytes of data and process new data uh, in roughly in the order of about 60 terabytes every day. In 2019, we were asked to alert on anomalies within our data. Our users found that in many cases, they have a hard time tracking uh, data sets that, uh, that we have in the system. And in many cases, they find about problems in the data after customers complain. And this is obviously not a great situation to be in. So we set out to build an anomaly detection system and make sure it can run on a huge scale of, uh, of data. We started with a pilot, uh, ended up going into, uh, with a beta into production, and then spent time uh, doing scale improvements and redesigns. In terms of the amount of data, when we started out, we had 15,000 time, time series, and this grew over time until today, we have over 1.1 million time series, and this is growing daily. In total, we have about 150 million data points in the system. So how do you detect anomalies? Let's look at an example. Let's say I was asked to predict the weather at noon on some particular day. I can look back at the weather since the morning and I would see that it was sunny and warm uh, throughout the previous hours. So very likely I would predict that at noon, it would also be sunny. We could wait till noon and then check the weather. And if it's sunny, then we would conclude that my prediction was okay and everything is great. We could do this again and again. And then if at some hour, suddenly it turns, uh, the, wet, the temperature drops, uh, it becomes very cloudy and dark and it starts snowing, that would obviously look very odd. And in this case, if I was running an alert service, I would probably send an alert to people. Hey guys, something has changed in the weather, uh, beware. So we would determine this is an anomaly. So in a nutshell, detecting anomalies involves creating some prediction model, predicting the future, and then comparing it to the actual values uh, when the time comes. And this is, all there is to it. So we started a pilot uh, within a naive architecture. Uh, we built it on a Postgres relational data storage. 
Uh, the reason we did this, it was really quick and easy uh, to get started and we could learn a lot about the user needs. So this was awesome for a POC. This was also great for a beta. Uh, it be started to become a bottleneck at scale. It became a bottleneck for two reasons. One, uh, scaling up and putting a lot of data and lots of queries on the relational database started becoming a bottleneck and we had slowdowns. And second, a relation database is not very cheap. So as you store more and more data and need to enlarge it, uh, it's obviously costs more uh, money. So uh, to move to the next step, uh, we re-architected the system and let's talk about how we did it and how we achieved scale and very low cost. The first decision we made was to go all out on serverless. We decided to use Lambda functions as a, the basic compute unit. Lambda functions are the serverless compute unit of, uh, of the AWS. Uh, we chose lazy execution, which means we don't process any data until it's needed. And the reason for that is we don't wanna process data and then discover nobody really needed it and we just wasted resources. And we moved the storage of the data from a relational database to low cost S3 storage. At the end of the day, we got very low cost and endless scale. Let's look at the architecture. We have a work manager Lambda that uh, wakes up, checks which jobs need to get processed and which data uh, arrived and needs processing, uh, creates uh, a task that is basically a message that's sent on a queue. And that invokes a worker Lambda that does all the work. The worker Lambda calculates the new data that comes in, does any aggregations or cleaning if, they're, if it's needed. It reads the previous uh, values of the time series, does uh, the predictions and stores that back. And if it finds anomalies, it will report the anomalies. So if we look at a, our unit of work, a Lambda gets a message with the time series it needs to and where to find them. It reads the configuration for those time series, which tells it, how uh, to aggregate the data, if there's any other cleaning that's needed, and the model to use, reads the time series uh, files for those time series from S3, does all the predictions and calculations, and stores back the results. And if it finds anomalies, we still use Postgres, but only for a little sliver of data of, uh, of the anomalies. Uh, so we store them in Postgres for lookup purposes, but again, this is a very uh, small amount of data, so it's not a big deal anymore. So what's the secret to scale and low cost in our uh, system? We use low cost storage, S3. We use low cost processing, which is Lambda functions, and they terminate. Once the processing is complete, they terminate and we no longer pay for them. And we get endless scale because we can invoke as many Lambda functions as we need as the system grows with more and more data. If you look at our cost, um, for 10,000 time series running a prediction once a day, we pay a mere $2.70. As you can see, storage is very negligible and the DB is also cheap because we don't store much in it. So it, we just store a small set of the anomalies. So in total for 10,000 time series, we pay $4.36 uh, a month which is obviously negligible. All right, so let's move on to talk about predictions and models. And to do that, I'm gonna pass it on to Max. Max? Thank you, Offer. All right, so let's uh, talk about uh, predictions. Prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. If we would ask people back in the 50s, how would the, the future will look like? They will probably say that they're gonna have flying cars back in their garages, but uh, today, currently, when we're already in this uh, future point, we see that they were wrong. And the reason for that is that it's very hard to predict so far into the future. And this is what we look at, actually see in this uh, chart. The longer the prediction uh, period is, the higher the error rate will be. And, but in our case, just like Offred showed you in the weather demonstration, we don't need that. We use short prediction. So we get only small errors. All we need is the next observation in order to identify if we have an anomaly, right? Okay, so let's see how does our uh, algorithm flow uh, works. So those numbers actually can be everything, right? They can be web traffic, they can be uh, sales, uh, or they can be anything that you can imagine. It. 
the algorithm will work in any case. So we take N, the first N observation and training our model and predicting the first value. This one is 11. And then we just uh, uh, compare it with the real value, it's 10. So between them, the we're still uh, in the standard uh, deviation by boundaries that is allowed. So we won't alert on anything. And then in the sliding window mode, we take the, uh, the end next observation. And again, training our model and predicting the next value. And again, here we're calculating the difference between the real value and the, and the predicted one. And we see that there is no difference. And again, let's take the third one. Again, we are predicting the number 10 and the, uh, the real value is 18. But in this case, the standard deviation is a uh, higher than the allowed boundaries. And therefore we will alert on this uh, observation as an anomaly. Great, so now we understand how does uh, our algorithm works, but uh, which model should we use? There is hundreds of them. And th there is a huge variety of uh, libraries that we can uh, support. For example, we use uh, currently the stat model uh, uh, library, but there is a, a lot of more that we can uh, choose. Luckily, our infrastructure built in a plug and play way. So all we need is to import the needed library with the, the model that we want to implement, extend some uh, basic abstract class and uh, implement few, few uh, simple methods. And that's it, the time to production is uh, super fast. All right, so now let's uh, take some uh, real life uh, example of uh, web traffic uh, uh, time series. And only by looking on the chart, we can already identify uh, the anomaly, right? It's here. But let's see how can we choose the right uh, model in order to, uh, and to fit it in order so we could identify this anomaly. First, we need to decompose the, the signal into three components. We have the seasonality component, uh, the trend component, and the noise. So the, the seasonality, it's, a, it's actually, a, it's a cycle that is a repeated of a, a trend that goes up and down in a certain period of time. For example, if we want to predict uh, tomorrow's sales, the most uh, naive way to do that is uh, take to turn today's uh, observation and say that tomorrow is gonna be the same, right? But what if tomorrow is a weekend day? It means that the uh, sales are gonna be much more higher than today. That, that's why we need to uh, take into consideration uh, last week uh, weekend and take the, uh, some uh, weight from that. Or if it's gonna be uh, holidays, so maybe we should take uh, last year's uh, holiday period and take uh, some weighted value from uh, uh, last year's uh, observation. And this is why it's important to identify the seasonality component in our signal. The next one is the trend. The trend is actually, it's uh, the growth rate of uh, our uh, signal. Uh, it, can be, it can grow linearly, for example, by uh, some certain percentage uh, between the observation, or it can uh, grow exponentially if it, it can uh, double himself every uh, observation. Uh, this one is very important to understand because uh, some of the models do support uh, trends and some others are require uh, stationary data. And obviously you can fix uh, your data in order to be stationary, uh, but uh, it's very uh, important to identi identify uh, whether you have the trend or not. And the last and not the least is the noise component. Uh, Let's take a, a, an example of uh, measuring the weather. And let's uh, uh, say that uh, currently we have uh, 25 degrees of Celsius. We take uh, some uh, measurement uh, device and it would uh, never uh, give you the, the exact uh, number of, it goes, uh, it will probably show you 24.9, maybe 25.1. But if the device uh, will be uh, legit, all the observation, the, the variance will be distributed uh, normally around the real, uh, the real uh, uh, number, the 25 uh, degrees of Celsius. And uh, so uh, actually the residual between the observed value and the, and the 
and the real one, this is the noise because it's unexplained. We do not know where, where, what is the reason for that noise. And uh, this component is very important in, in our case because if our uh, noise component distributed normally, we can test it by, if we have a certain test for that, it means that the, our model is actually have all the needed feature in order to uh, forecast uh, uh, the future. And all, uh, all we need is to add the noise component to complete it and be very, very precise. And, uh, and again, there, uh, there is uh, some specific models that uh, do support uh, uh, noise uh, if, if it's uh, distributed uh, normally. After we decompose the signal and uh, chose uh, the right uh, model, model that uh, fits uh, our uh, specific uh, time series, we can see how does it uh, perform. We see that uh, our model actually uh, takes a couple of days uh, behind and it's actually it's expecting to have the same pattern that it has uh, like in the previous days. But the real data actually have uh, some uh, decrease in the data. So th that's why it uh, actually shows uh, an anomaly on this uh, specific uh, observation. All right, trust. How can we actually gain trust uh, with our end user? We have uh, uh, understood that uh, no matter how good your infrastructure is and how precise your model, model we still need to uh, uh, gain trust with our end user in order for him to, uh, to uh, really uh, work with our uh, infrastructure. And, and the solution for that was uh, that we have implemented a push notification uh, via Slack with all the statistical uh, uh, data that uh, the end user would uh, like to have. But we have uh, we saw that it's it's very hard to imagine and see with all this uh, data how does it, what really happening with your data only by uh, see uh, some uh, message. So we have added a picture, and as you know, one picture equals a thousand words. And by looking on this uh, picture, you getting so much more information about uh, uh, the the anomaly that you 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 see or uh, the difference between the real data and uh, and the, the predicted one. And uh, by that, we uh, the end user could actually believe in our system and, uh, and started uh, to use it. Okay, so let's uh, summarize and see what we, we have uh, talked about. We talked about how to keep our cost uh, low by uh, using uh, uh, cheap uh, components, how to design our system to be uh, scalable and uh, support uh, endless scale, the importance of gaining the trust with our end user and how to fit uh, the, uh, the right model for our specific uh, data. And here is the recipe of how to do it. Low cost, get uh, loose uh, uh, all those uh, expensive uh, parts such as the uh, relational data stores. And uh, in our case, we use the serverless, uh, serverless uh, AWS uh, Lambda infrastructure and save all our data in S3 buckets. Scale, we took all our uh, workload, split it into small uh, units of uh, work so the cost would be steady and the scale will be endless. Trust, build some features that you would be able to gain trust with your end users, such as the, our uh, uh, push notification to see all the, the needed information. And the models, by using uh, some uh, plug and play uh, infrastructure that you can implement in no time, some uh, new models, the time to production goes uh, super high, uh, fast and uh, makes our infrastructure very good. Thank you very much. Don't forget to rate us high. Thank you.